Silver on the Tree by Susan Cooper, Chapter 4, Midsummer Day. At a triumphant trot, Will mowed the last patch of grass and collapsed, panting, draped over the lawnmower handle. Sweat was trickling down the side of his nose, and his bare chest was damp, speckled with tiny cut stems of grass. Oof, it's even hotter than yesterday. Sundays, James said, are always hotter than Saturday, especially if you live in a village with a small stuffy church. James Stanton's Law, you can call that. Go on, said Stephen, passing with his hands full of twine and clippers. It wasn't that bad. And for two horrible little boys, you sound pretty angelic in the choir. He dodged neatly as Will flung a fistful of grass cuttings. I shan't be there much longer, James said with some pride. I'm breaking. Did you, did you hear me crack in the canticle? You'll be back, Will said. Tenor bet you. I suppose so. That's what Paul says, too. He's practicing. Listen. Distant as a fading drum from inside the house, the soft, clear tone of a flute rippled up and down in scales and, arpe and, arpe and arpeggios. It seemed as much a part of the hot, still afternoon as the bees humming in the lupins and the sweet smell of the new-cut grass. Then the scales gave way to a long, lovely flow of melody repeated again and again. Halfway across the lawn, Stephen stood, caught into stillness, listening. My God, he said, he's good, isn't he? What is that? Mozart, M Mozart, first flute concerto, Will said. He's playing with the NYO this, uh, this autumn. NYO? National Youth Orchestra, you remember. He was in it for years, even before he went to the Academy. Suppose I do. I've been away so long. It's a big honor, that concert, James said. At the Festival Hall, no less. Didn't Paul tell you? You know Paul, old modesty. There's a lovely sounding flute he's got now, too. Even I can tell. Miss Graythorne gave it to him two Christmases ago, said Will, from the manor. There's a collection that her father made she showed us. Miss Graythorne, good Lord, that takes me back. Sharp wit, sharp tongue. I bet she hasn't changed a bit. Will smiled. She never will. She caught me up. She caught me up her almond tree once when I was a kid, Stephen said, grinning reminiscently. I came climbing down, and there she was out of nowhere in her wheelchair, even though she hated anyone seeing that wheelchair. Only monkeys eat my nuts, young man, she said. I can still hear her. And you'll not even make a powder monkey at your age. Powder monkey, James said. Boys in the Navy in Nelson's day. They used to fetch the powder for the guns. You mean Miss Graythorne knew you were going into the Navy? Of course not. I didn't know. Of course not. I didn't know, that, know myself then. Stephen looked a little taken aback. Funny coincidence, though. It never occurred to me before. I haven't given her a thought in for years. But James's mind was already taken off on a tangent. But James's mind had already taken off on a tangent, as it frequently did. Will, whatever became of that little hunting horn she gave you, the year she gave Paul the flute, did you lose it? You never even gave it one good blow. I still have it, said Will quietly. Well, get it out. We can have fun with it. One day, Will swung the lawnmower around, shoving its handle at James's unready hands. Here, your turn. I've done the front, now you do the back. That's the rule, said their father, passing with a weed-loaded wheelbarrow. Fair is fair. Share the burden. My burden's bigger than his, said James dolefully. Nonsense, said Mr. Stanton. Well, it is, actually, Will said. We've measured once. The back lawn's five feet wider than the front, and ten feet longer. Got more trees in it, said Mr. Stanton, unclipping the catch box of the grass cuttings from the front of the mower and emptying it into his, into his barrow. That makes more work, not less, James drooped more dolefully still. Going round then, trimming afterwards. Go away, said his father, before I burst into tears. Will took the box and clipped it back on the mower. Goodbye, James, he said cheerfully. You haven't finished yet either, matey, Mr. Stanton said. Stephen needs some help tying up the roses. A muffled curse came from the front garden wall. Stephen, embraced by the sprawling branches of a climbing rose, was sucking his thumb. I believe you may be right, Will said. Grinning, his father picked up the wheelbarrow and prodded James and the lawnmower up the driveway. Will was sti Will was starting over the lawn with his elder si when his elder sister Barbara came out of the front door. Tea's nearly ready, she said. Good. 
Outside we're having it. Good, better, best. Come help Steve fight a rose bush. Rambler roses spilling great sw swaths and bunches of red blossom grew along and over the old stone wall that bordered the road. Gingerly they unhinged the most wildly spiraling arms, drove stakes into the gravelly earth, and tied the branches to keep the billowing sprays of roses off the ground. Ouch! said Barbara for the fifth time as a rebellious rose branch scored a thin red line across her bare back. It's your own fault, said Will unfeelingly. You should have more clothes on. It's a sunsuit for sunshine, Ducky. Nakedness, said her younger brother solemnly. Be a shameful condition for a, for a human being. Tain't right. Tis a disgrace to the neighborhood, so it is. Barbara looked at him. There you stand, wearing even less... She began indignantly, then stopped. Slow, said Stephen, very slow. Oh, you, Barbara said. A car passed on the road, slowed suddenly, stopped, then began backing gradually until it was level with them. The driver switched off his engine, hauled himself across the, st the street, and stuck a heavy-jowled red face out the window. Might the biggest of you be Stephen Stanton, he said with clumsy joviality. That's right, said Stephen. From top of the wall, he gave one last blow of a st to the stake. What can I do for you? Name's Moore, said the man. You had a little run-in with one of my boys the other day, I gather. Richie, said Will. Ah, said Stephen. He jumped down from the wall to stand next to the car. How do you do, Mr. Moore? I dropped your son into some water, I believe. Green water, said the man. Ruined his shirt. I shall be happy to buy him a new one, Stephen said easily. What size is he? Don't talk rubbish, the man said expressionless. I just wanted to get the rights and wrongs of it, that's all. Wondered why a young man like you should be playing those sort of games with kids. Stephen said, it wasn't a game, Mr. Moore. I simply felt very strongly that your son deserved to be dropped into the water. Mr. Moore ran one hand over his large, glistening forehead. Maybe, maybe he's a wild kid, that one. They kick him around, he kicks back. What did he do to you? Didn't he tell you, Will said. Mr. Moore looked across the low wall at Will, as though he were something small and irrelevant like a beetle. What Richie told me, it wasn't something that gets people dropped in streams. So like as not, it wasn't true. That's what I want to get straight. He was tormenting a younger boy. He was tormenting a younger boy, Stephen said. There's not much point going into detail. Having a bit of fun, he said. Not much fun for the other one. Richie didn't, said he didn't lay a finger on him, Mr. Moore said. He just threw his music case full of music into the stream. That's all Will said shortly. Well, said Mr. Moore. He paused, tapping the edge of, the, of his car window absently. It was that Indian kid from the common, I gather. The three Stantons stood looking at him in silence. He stared back blankly. At length, Barbara said in a small, polite voice, Does that make a difference? Before the man could answer, Mr. Stanton said amiably from behind them, Good afternoon. Afternoon, said Mr. Moore, turning his head with a tinge of relief in his tone. I'm Jim Moore. We were just... Yes, I heard some of it, Mr. Stanton said. He propped himself against the edge of the wheelbarrow. He had just sat down, took out his pipe and matches. I must say, I thought Steve might have overreached himself a bit that day. Still, the thing is, you can't always believe these people, you see, said the man in the car, smiling confident, smiling confident of agreement. There was a silence. Mr. Stanton lit his pipe, he said, puffing and blowing out the match. I don't quite follow, I'm afraid, Stephen said coldly. It wasn't a case of believing anyone. It was just of what I happened to see myself. Mr. Moore was looking at Mr. Stanton with a kind of anxious adult bonhomie. Made a lot of fuss about nothing, that kid, I dare say. You know how they are, always on about something. True, true, said Roger Stanton, his round f face pallid. Mine usually are. Oh, no, 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 said Mr. Moore heartily. I'm sure your bunch are very nice. I meant coloreds, not kids. He went on, plowing unawares for the silence that came again. I see a lot of them at work. I'm in personnel, you know, times manufacturing. Not much I don't know about Indians and packies. After all these years, of course, I've got nothing against them personally. Very intelligent, well-educated, some of them. 
and got myself an op from an Indian doctor at the Memorial Hospital last year. Clever little chap he was, and we will pause there.